um hello first of all good afternoon to you all and i wish to apologize for not being there with you unfortunately we have our students a uh, new batch of students coming tomorrow and there was no way i could leave at this time i would like to briefly run you through the analysis that we have been doing in terms of meta synthesis of the gender and social differentiation work over the last couple of years across the career consortia so the uh, uh sorry about that so the uh, rationale for the meta synthesis and for the use of uh, qca was really that the carrier has worked on the basis of a hotspot approach and while the hotspot the parameters for hotspots are climatic variables but also social vulnerabilities and livelihood crises these lat latter two are less taken into account we have several micro studies on gender and socially differentiated vulnerabilities to an impacts of climate change however these remain as micro studies as interesting case studies but we are not able to take a last, larger message through so we decided on qca or the qualitative comparative analysis as a method that bridges qualitative and quantitative analysis it looks in depth at a range of cases at a series of cases to try and find out cross case patterns to be able to predict that what might be um the conditions that are leading to or the configuration of conditions that are leading to particular outcomes so it takes account of context specific heterogeneity at the same time as trying to uh, bring in an element of predictability about potential pathways to enable positive change so the background really was that uh, we met at the alr2 in rotterdam and got the idea of doing a meta synthesis as part of the gender inequity group the uh, osf grant came through from uh, caria idrc we had a small core group of people in the gender inequity group who then organized a meeting in abu dhabi in march 2017 to work out what might be the conceptual moorings of uh, this kind of an analysis which led to the selection of study sites the field research and we developed a format on the basis of our methodology which was completed by the end of last year this year we had a capacity building and a participatory analysis workshop in dubai at the end of january which came up with a set of results we've continued refining on those results of bringing in qualitative findings from across the consortia to actually explain these results and are in the process of finalizing the draft paper emerging from this So the research question that really was that what is the combination of conditions that can support or dampen women's agency contributing to improved adaptation responses or pathways across climate hotspots and rather than having these as very divided small scale examples we thought we would it would be interesting to construct some kind of pathways or typologies of risk factors and relating them to outcomes so here is one which we discuss later that in response to environmental stress a lot of male migration but clearly the picture on the right is from the indian context and as a result women are often left behind to manage farming in addition to all the additional responsibilities so there's a rural feminization of agriculture without adequate support so our case study uh, locations then across carrier hotspots uh is um, as follows as in the map we had covered several countries of africa and south asia particularly also tajikistan so from asar we had nine cases from semi arid contexts from prize again from semi arid contexts we have five cases from highwear leading with the mountain and snow capped regions six cases and from dekma dealing with the delta uh three cases so a total of 25 cases was actually the data that we used for the qca analysis in terms of the methodology that i mentioned our final outcome variable was women's agency we did believe or we do believe that strengthening women's agency can actually contribute to improved adaptive capacities and in turn adaptation when we looked at women's agency these conditions were very much informed by the literature coming out from gender gender and development gender analysis feminist research around on gender and climate change and so on 
So the factors contributing to women's agency are both material as well as social in terms of, say, in decision-making at different levels, participation. And the conditions we developed for a set of seven uh, conditions. These include the material conditions, education of men and women, health, food security, indebtedness, productive assets, uh, mobility and migration as a second condition, environmental stress as a third condition, household structures, which included mobility norms, household headship, household structures, incidents of violence as the fourth condition, social capital as the fifth uh, uh, condition, and I'm sorry, the last two conditions had dropped out of the slide, but they include the sixth condition was really around state interventions, looking at social protection programs, laws and supportive laws and policies, access to basic services and information. And the final condition on women's work and labor looked at time, women, the time burdens, women's effort burdens or drudgery, the type of the labor market in which they were engaged, like informal or formal employment, and whether they had the possibility of developing an independent enterprise. So once we ran this data, uh, we, we accumulated it on an Excel spreadsheet and then ran it on the QCA uh, software, we got I mean, the two pathways which emerged. But very interestingly, we were looking for positive outcomes in terms of women's agency. And what we came was that negative outcomes across our 25 case studies, a majority actually showed a negation of women's agency rather than a strengthening of women's agency. And the coverage score for this, for the negation of women's agency, was, was very high. Uh, at 0.91 with a consistency score of 0.79, which are considered very good within the QCA kind of setup. So most of our cases, except for two, were covered by these two pathways, which showed a negation of women's agency. As I said, there were a few cases which showed positive agency, and we call these as logical contradictions because they also come within the negation of women's agency. And I'll discuss this briefly at the end. So across these two pathways, in the first pathway, we have 20 cases, and in the second pathway, seven cases. And this is because some of the cases come across both pathways. So two of the common things which are important to highlight is that environmental stress and women's poor working conditions are common factors linked uh, uh, work poor working conditions, as I said, includes uh, uh, drudgery, lack of uh, time for leisure, informal employment, insecure employment, and so on. And partly this is linked to male migration because you have that when men are migrating, as I said at the start, that you have often an increase in women's work burdens in these contexts of environmental stress of natural resource degradation. So these are really drivers. I think it kind of justifies the hotspot approach that in context of environmental stress, actually, it's very hard for women to exercise agency and to develop adaptive capacity and positive adaptation outcomes without external or extra additional support. So the first pathway with these two elements in common was really around institutional outcomes where we are looking at social capital and state interventions. And what we find that both are seen as very important in terms of providing this external support to strengthen women's agency. But what we find across these 20 cases is that they tend to substitute with each other. Instead of having a complementary effect, they tend to substitute for each other. So where social capital actually, instead of empowering women, is leading to basically substituting for the lack of state uh, intervention. And we found this across the board. So for instance, if there's a lack of childcare, then your women's groups or your mothers or other kinship relations come in to help support with childcare. So rather than leading to a further improved outcome, they're actually having a substitution effect. And this is because social capital and legal, uh, social protection, sorry, and legal provisions where they exist are not properly implemented. I've already spoken about male migration, which reduces, apart from the fact that men are absent, it also reduces community cohesion because a lot of the action 
uh, in terms of decision making at the community level is done by men. So when men are away, actually the wives are not able to participate in these community institutions and collective action is somewhat re reduced. Women's self-help groups has been an important strategy for actually building collection, collective action amongst women. But in the absence of skills, capacities, resources, actually, they fail to have a strong empowering effect. When we look at pathway two, which is really looking at the combination of a favorable household conditions in terms of headship, in terms of mobility norms and so on, and the structure of the household and material poverty or conditions of poverty. And here we find that despite having a supportive household, actually people in conditions of poverty, and we're already having this larger context of environmental stress and poor working conditions for, for women, that they tend to dampen women's agency. And here poverty is reflected in low levels of education, in poor health outcomes, in indebtedness, in lack of food security, we had several people complaining about, you know, growing malnutrition or undernutrition, not having enough resources for food, crops being destroyed due to drought, not having enough for seed, and so on. And herds being lost because of uh, drought, decimated, not having the resources to restock. So these various factors actually end up dampening agency because you're just struggling on an everyday basis for survival. So, as I said, we had some cases and within the QCA, these are called logical contradictions, which showed positive women's agency, but at the same time, they also appear in the negation of women's agency. And I take some examples to illustrate that how, why sort of in-depth qualitative information is really important for interpreting these cases. So, P4, that is from Prize, it's about women entrepreneurs in Kenya, and they actually have a excellent uh, outcome in terms of agency. But when we look at the characteristics, we see that they are from better families, they are in urban contexts, and we also see this from another case in peri-urban Bangalore, that those who are in urban contexts seem to have access to greater opportunities for entrepreneurship, for better working conditions, and so on. So in a way, you're overturning the dampening indicator of migration and women's working condition. Uh, and at the same time, Kenya has a supportive legal structure, framework, and also supportive household structures, which shows the positive outcome. Uh, but uh, why it also comes under negation of women's agency is that in many of these enterprises, which are dependent on natural resources, in the context of environmental stress and resource degradation, the inputs for their entrepreneurial activities themselves decline. So the scale of their business and the benefits from their business decline. A second case is A8, SR8, which is dealing with rural communities in Mali. And here again, we have high levels of women's agency. The explanation really comes from unpacking the household. So in Mali, and West Africa in general, you have household compounds, which are multi-generational households, including senior men, their wives, their children, the children's wives, families, grandchildren, and so on. And here we find a hierarchy even amongst women. So older women have a lot of agency to control and distribute food and work, while younger women responsible for these tasks have little decision-making voice. So until and unless we have this contextual understanding, we are not able to interpret the result. Another case is A7, SR7 in Namibia, which is multi-ethnic communities. And here you find very strong state action and constitutional provision in terms of relief, pensions, support grants, and so on. But what it has ended up doing has to create dependence, to create individualism, where each person is trying to get benefits from the state rather than strengthening local collective action for risk preparedness. So the final point I would like to conclude with is that women's agency, of course, in all its complexity is central to the success of adaptation interventions. The drivers of agency are multiple and they work across institutional sites and scales from the household to the community, market, state institutions. Often we find that norms and practices and social relations across these different institutions 
actually mutually shape each other and they may end up watering down benefits which come from one particular institution when you have regressive norms across another institution. So the efforts to strengthen the adaptive capacity of poor women and indeed men need to move beyond stereotypes to think creati creatively about these range of resources and opportunities and their configurations and they work together to create an enabling environment for women to exercise their agency. So just magic bullet kind of single point approaches often don't work because we do need a combination of conditions in order to advance uh, the agenda. Finally, the climate hotspots approach actually is validated because environmental stress is a depressor of women's agency across contexts. And therefore, it's very important that institutional support across these various levels, including provision of wider services and infrastructure, are key to enabling women's agency. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, if possible, I will try and answer uh, questions. Uh, and again, once again, very sorry for not being with you today. Thank you.